Good morning. I am uh, Dr. Robert Moore Home Hill. I reside in the Seattle Department. And we're just going to begin with a, a quote from Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton. If a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now, this is one of the most quoted but likely least understood quotes of the exceedingly quotable G.K. Chesterton. And I hope to demonstrate this today. After all, if a paper is worth giving, it's worth giving badly. Or if a face is worth shaving, it's worth shaving badly. <laughs> this is actually on behalf of the, the C.S. Lewis class. So it's an inside joke. Okay. I'm going to return in a few moments to explaining in more depth the context and meaning of this sentence. But for now, uh, let me begin by simply saying two things. First, Chesterton is not encouraging shoddy work, especially in the classroom or in writing, though he did write an essay entitled On Writing Badly, where he suggests Writing badly, anyone can understand who writes it all. I, for one, do it perpetually. Writing badly is the definition of journalism. <laughs> Writing badly is almost, in such cases, the definition of living honestly. He said he succeeded at becoming a journalist by failing to be an artist. So he practiced some of this in his own life. But secondly, when Chesterton says, if a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly, what he really means is we should not place our most essentially human affairs in the hands of the experts. Instead, we should endeavor, no matter how badly, to do the thing ourselves. Now, it's important for us to acknowledge how much of our culture relies on experts and to recognize just how thoroughly this, this very modern trend uh, affects all of our notions when it comes to work. So pretend that there's a board up here that I could, I could sketch on, and let's identify some of our chief cultural experts. Who would be some of the, the professionals? What categories? What kinds of jobs? Doctors? Yes. Lawyers? Theologians? What else was that? Counselors? Politicians? Scientists, right? Okay. Good. Uh, specialized medicine, especially, I think we could think of. So, most of us. I'm going to take for granted want a good job, and we won't, won't ask for a, a, a sign of hands here. And it's generally true of our culture. And, and so by a good job, we usually understand the sort of work that affords a comfortable lifestyle, while giving us a modicum of status, uh, doing some civic good, as well as providing us with some existential meaning. And the way to obtain that good job is to go to college, to study hard, and then to parcel yourself off to grad school, to law school, or to med school, and to pursue a path of professionalism. What do you do? That might represent the essence of the three temptations of Christ. Uh, and, and if you think of these, turning bread to stones, uh, a swan dive off of the temple, being caught by the angels, and you can have control over all the kingdoms of the world. Uh, this is production, performance, and power. The essence of uh, Americans at work. Production, performance, and how, why do we work? So we might consider this, uh, what do you do as the quintessential American 
temptation to save the world through power. And of course, good power. Good power for others, right? Uh, power not for ourselves, but power always applied brilliantly, expertly, because we're so damn smart. After all, the ugly American is the expert, isn't he? He is so obnoxious because he knows it all. No matter what culture she or he walks into. And yet, professionals, these are the individuals in society that we aspire to become, the power people. And so this morning, I will argue that following a path of work towards professionalism if we're not careful, may not only set us up for failure, but may shrink our souls spiritually, leaving us in the end as shriveled shells of human beings. Listen carefully this, uh, to this Wendell Berry warning. Most people in the developed world have given proxies to the corporations to produce and provide all of their food, clothing, and shelter. Moreover, they are rapidly giving proxies to corporations or governments to provide entertainment, education, child care, care of the sick and the elderly, and many other kinds of service that once were carried on informally and inexpensively by individuals or households or communities. Our major economic practice, in short, is to delegate the practice to others. Is it that we're so afraid of doing something badly uh, that we won't risk doing things ourselves anymore? Barry communicates something here we desperately need to hear because we continue to farm out, pun intended, so much of what is most essentially human, most spiritually sacred, in fact, for others to do for us. We entrust others to live our lives for us. And in so doing, we first set ourselves up for failure because this puts us on a road toward perfectionism that will leave us driven and fearful in the end. Someone else out there is always better, faster, smarter, stronger, better looking, richer than we are. And room for people at the top in our society constitutes a rapidly shrinking space. Secondly, we set ourselves up for soul shriveling as we remove ourselves from primary experience, whereas God created us to be immersed in nature, in relationships, in the, the messy stewardship of the creation, which, which means trying to do things even if we have to do them badly. And, and third, I think we set ourselves up for narrowness because Human beings were made to live as generalists, as problem solvers in a broader, wilder world, confronting a variety of tasks and challenges. That's, that's how we grow. The smaller the work, the more fragmented, perhaps the smaller the soul in the end. In fact, professionalism stands opposite in many ways to liberal arts as liberating, as setting us free. Chesterton's assertion that a thing worth doing is worth doing badly appears in his book, What's Wrong with the World, in the last lines of chapter 14, which is titled, Education, or the Mistake About the Child. Like Barry, Chesterton consistently defended the amateur against the specialist. And you can imagine the importance of the example he chooses here, that of raising children. Raising children is arguably the most important job in the world, 
and yet we consistently give it to others to do for us. Right? Thus, Chesterton anticipated the dilemma of modern day care. So as an example, let me describe uh, our situation in raising our only child, Ansley. Uh, early on, we were very fortunate. Uh, we, we were in university and, and church settings, so our time was very flexible. So for the first four years of her life, we were in Indiana. Uh, we had one nanny come in, a woman from our church, that the whole four years for three hours a day. And it was wonderful. Uh, when we moved here, she started grade school at Warner, uh, which is a, a lovely school that no parent uh, can fail to, to, to sort of be frightened at this prospect of handing your child over for all of these hours uh, of the day to a public edu education system, which um, infiltrates all sorts of nastiness in them. <coughs> all manner of, uh, of, of heresy, all sorts of disagreeable habits. Now, throughout the talk today, I, I want us to keep this question in mind. What are the things worth doing, even if it means doing them poorly or doing them for ourselves? Worth doing, even if we suspect uh, we're not all that great at them, like educating our children. In fact, Chesterton readily admitted that the thing worth doing should sometimes be handed over to the expert. Certain things should not be left up to the amateurs. So um, groups of two or three where you're at, uh, describe some things that you, you really want done in our society by the experts, okay? Believe me then. <laughs> of our jury system with these thoughts. Our civilization has decided, very justly decided, that determining the guilt or innocence of men is a thing too important to be trusted to trained men. If it wishes for life upon that awful matter, it asks men who know no more law than I know that you can feel the things that I felt in the jury box. When it wants a library catalog, or the solar system discovered, or any trifle of that kind, it uses up specialists. But when it wishes anything done which is really serious, 
It collects 12 of the ordinary men standing around. The same thing was done, if I remember rightly, by the founder of Christianity. <laughs> when G.K. suggests a thing worth doing uh, is worth doing badly, he's also defending the hobby, the amateur over the professional. For an amateur is someone who does something not for money but for love. I run slowly. Eric Mackinson will tell you painfully slowly. Uh, badly even when it comes to pace and distance, but I love running, so I do it often badly. Uh, and, and I'm a poor artist, but I still paint. And so think of this. Look at the other look at things out there that, that are worth doing, uh, even if they're worth doing that. And, and in fact, maybe even especially they're worth doing. Uh, much of what we do in the dorm for fun is worth doing because it's worth doing badly, right? If you go, if you play um, floor hockey, or if you're bowling, you know, uh, intramurals is worth doing because it's worth doing badly, right? If, if you're if you're too if you're too um, competitive in intramurals, you're there for the wrong reason. You, you've got to show up, you know, not really wanting to lose, but but being being willing at least to have a bad game. So what is it about these things? It's the doing of them, right? It's not the final product. It's in the very doing that we express uh, our humanness. And so why don't we do things for ourselves more often, even if we do them badly? Why do we farm out our farms, our kids, our lives to the experts? Well, sometimes it's just not practical. The world has sped ahead so fast, becoming so technical. There are things that I'd not only rather not do, engine work on my car, or fixing my computer, or tinkering with my plumbing at home. Uh, these are things that I have a hard time doing. And some of them I might undertake, but the cost of the mistake uh, is, is really prohibitive. And the sheer amount of time it would take when it comes to the learning curve make doing the thing not practical or sensible. These are not things really worth doing. So in one sense, we're talking about the fragmentation of the modern world and modern life. Chesterton suggests, the modern worker is confined to making the thousandth part of a motor car or the 10,000th part of a daily newspaper. By being a specialist, the modern worker is made narrow. What I'm constantly tempted to ask myself is, what if any of these specializations might be reversible, and how we might be better off as a culture if we were able to reverse them? Now, I think that both Chesterton and Barry are accused often of, of sort of romanticizing the village, uh, the simple, the past, uh, and, and wishing that we could get back to another era that perhaps we can't get back to. Um, here's, here's Chesterton's response to that. There is one metaphor of which the moderns are very fond. They are always saying, you can't put the clock back. The simple and obvious answer is you can. A clock being a piece of human construction can be restored by the human finger to any figure or color. In the same way, society, being a piece of human construction, can be reconstructed upon any plan that has ever existed. But another reason why we don't want to try doing the thing worth doing is simply because we're afraid. And, and if, if you think about the above examples of fixing my car. You know, there's, there's the fear of failure. Honey, I just blew up the car. Would you come and help me put it out, please? Uh, you know, there's the cost involved, but there's also this haunting fear, I think, that whispers, if I take time to do that, instead of continuing to amass points towards my professional specialization as an expert, I'll never really amount to and then I'll really be a failure. 
And that's why we make ourselves, I think, so damn busy in life. I'm using that word theologically. <laughs> working so frantically to get the job, working so frantically to keep the job, uh, and, and, and to do the job right that we don't have adequate time for the best things in life. And so we end up really, in a sense, never living our life, always sort of watching ourselves. Uh, kind of from the sideline. We relinquish the right to really live. Now, as an important aside, I want us to notice how in the West, we really don't like things to be empty. Almost as if we fear what it might cause or create, uh, what it might force us to face. So we fill up empty space with strip malls and highways and buildings. We fill up empty time with faster and better and newer uh, and always with more. And we fill up empty silence with music especially, but with internet, and TV, and movies. And even texting becomes a kind of clattering noise in our souls. I would say contrast even Europe, uh, at least when it comes to space and time which does much better with zoning and with cities and with green space, giving chance for creativity. If there's no empty canvas, there can be no painting. The German work week is 37 hours with six weeks mandatory vacation a year. And yet they seem to be fairly productive as cultures. Why are we afraid of the empty? Because the empty puts us awkwardly in touch with the other and with ourselves. Pascal, all human problems could be solved by people spending a few hours alone in a room each day. Kierkegaard, talkativeness is always afraid of silence because silence reveals its emptiness. Silence reveals talkativeness's emptiness. Silence as emptiness may reveal that I am empty, and doing a thing worth doing and doing it badly may imply a kind of contemplative silence, a kind of deep breath that embraces humility. We're terrified that we do emptiness badly, that we do silence badly. And so doing a thing worth doing badly implies moving into a place of existential risk. Doing something myself puts me in touch with a, a liminal space, with edges, uh, with emptiness, with my own limitations and finitude. Doing this thing requires me to practice courage, humility, a list of other virtues that, that invite me to die to myself to risk failure and foolishness. And yet, it's actually the doing of that thing we're doing badly which moves me into a, a much larger world. In describing the paranoid person who fears everyone around them, Chesterton says, but how much happier you would be if you only knew that these people cared nothing about you? How much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in it? You would break out of this tiny and fluttering theater in which your own little plot is always being played, and you would find yourself under a freer sky in a street full of splendid strangers. Maybe we care too much what other people think. The smaller, the more ordinary, the more humble, the things up badly, that's what sets us free. So work seen from within the broader picture of our lives uh, in the context of life as a whole, where we're not able to control everything, I would suggest becomes a kind of holy ground, ground on which we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And hopefully includes a, a healthier image of ourselves as small but significant in a vast universe. By becoming more ordinary, we become more mystical, maybe less sure, but closer to God. Whereas the workaholic easily becomes a monomaniac, 
the world begins to revolve around only one thing for her, and she becomes crazed. These are the sorts of folks, according to Chesterton, who go insane, the specialists. Imagination does not breed insanity. Exactly what does breed insanity is reason. Poets do not go mad, but chess players do. Mathematicians go mad. Sorry. Mathematicians go mad and cashiers, but creative artists very seldom. Poetry is sane because it floats easily in an infinite sea. Reason seeks to cross the infinite sea and so make it finite. The result is mental exhaustion. The poet only desires exaltation and expansion, a world to stretch himself in. The poet only asks to get his head into the heavens. It is the logician who seeks to get the heavens into his head, and it is in his head that splits. The madman, the expert, is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. And so Chesterton calls us instead to a healthy mysticism. Um, he always says that the ordinary man is sane because he's always been a mystic. He's, he's been able to hold two contradictions together uh, and, and accept them both as true. So he's inviting us out of the narrow confines of the specialist and into a much larger universe toward breadth, imagination, mysticism, paradox. So balancing work and the other facets of our life, relationships, leisure, self-care, hobbies, thus becomes a crucible, a stage on which we're spiritually born for better or worse. And it has to do not with salvation as perfection, as in getting the thing right, but in salvation as reintegration, as, as wholeness, uh, as healing, as learning to love and trust and to let go of control. Does it mean we don't strive to do our work well? By no means. It does mean that work ought to be considered as one part of a bigger life in relation to God, family, community, and creation. Now, I'm going to hand out, we've got 50 copies here. I don't really expect anybody to show up. <laughs> so. This is a, a copy of the quote that the larger context of where this quote comes from, if the thing is worth doing, it's worth doing badly. So let me wait just for a moment while that, um, while that moves around. And I'd like to read the quote and then sort of look at some of the themes here. Maybe you can share if, if um, there's someone next to you that read along with you. So What's Wrong with the World is a, a set of, of essays, uh, a critique of, of Chesterton's. And as I said, this is the chapter on education, uh, the mistake about the child. Let me go ahead and begin. Uh, and I still going towards the back there. There was a time when you and I and all of us were all very close to God. So that even now the color of a pebble or a paint, the smell of a flower or a firework comes to our hearts with a kind of authority and certainty, as if they were fragments of a muddled message or features of a forgotten face. To pour that fiery simplicity upon the whole of life is the only real aim of education. And closest to the child comes the woman. She understands. To say what she understands is beyond me. To say only this, that it is not a solemnity. Rather, it is a towering levity, an uproarious amateurish amateurishness of the universe, such as we felt when we were little, and would as soon sing as garden, as soon paint as run. 
to smell the tongues of men and angels, to dabble in the dreadful sciences, to juggle with pillars and pyramids and toss up the planets like balls. This is that inner audacity and indifference which the human soul, like a conjurer, catching foreign business, keep on ground. This is that insanely frivolous thing we call sound. And the elegant female, drooping her ringlets over her watercolors, knew it and acted on it. She was juggling with frantic and flaming sons. She was maintaining the bold equilibrium of inferiorities, which is the most mysterious of the superiorities, and perhaps the most unattainable. She was maintaining the prime truth of woman, the universal mother, that if the thing is worth doing, it is worth doing badly. So let me say first, I don't really want to get into Chesterton's anti-feminism. I really believe the woman uh, you know, should be at the head. It should at least have the option of, of staying at the home. And this, this famous quote, you know, the women in the, in the late 19th century, they said, we will not be dictated to, so they all went out and became stenographers. You know, and so the, the sense that uh, this is actually the narrowing of the woman. This woman who had this, this amazing command of this whole world of these, these tiny minds and bodies being formed. And she was, uh, she was not the expert, but she was involved in everything that was most important in civilization. And now we've put her in a, in a room with a desk and a little typewriter. Anyway. Uh, so aside from his, his the kind of angel in the home romanticism of, of women that I, I don't always agree with. I want you to look at some of the some of the themes here. First, the aim of education. What is the aim of education? Is is this bread? Uh, it's to get us in touch with what's what is most human. But it's very experimental here. You know, it's uh, it has to do with with things like. Um, uh, the tactile, the smell of flowers and fireworks. Um, and behind all of this, uh, and, and you, you can see down below, he's really talking about uh, the, the liberal arts here. To smatter the tongues of men and angels, that's language, that's literature. Uh, to dabble in the dreadful sciences, right? To juggle with pillars and pyramids is both architecture and math, right? So we, we've got the the trivium and the, the quadrivium that he's referring to here. And he's saying that in order to stay sane, we've got to, we've got to stay, we've got to juggle these. We have to have these in some sort of balance. The minute we get way off into one side uh, and, and, and put ourselves into a little room, that's where the danger comes. Not only to society in the sense of giving control over to the experts who are now going to uh, you know, do some things to, to our food, genet genetically modify our food so that, so that it's ruined for us. Uh, but but not, not just that on, that on that sort of big brother scale, but even on the smaller scale of our lives. That we were made to, uh, even if we can't draw well, to, to like that smell of paint. Back before we knew that we had to be concerned about whether someone was gonna critique our picture or our drawing, right? What, what, to, to be able to, to play with these things. And so there's an incredible humility in life here. There's a kind of humility, and it's the humility and the frivolity and the humor are what are most human in some sense. Try it. Fail at it. Laugh at yourself, right? Uh, this, is, this is what Chester would say. It would say, angels can fly because they can take themselves lightly. Satan fell from the force of gravity. Right? Is Satan probably gave you a Richard Nixon in your force of gravity. I mean, no, he was just looking at that way too seriously, you know? Um, so so that there's, the, there's this sense of, of mystical playfulness in, in all of this. And that's what, that's what education um, really ought to be, especially prior to grad school. <laughs> grad school, you can specialize, right? So what we're talking about here, too, is that the, the woman, and let me just say here, it's the primary caretaker. 
It doesn't have to be the woman. The, 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 the man at home, if the woman's got the primary uh, you know, task of earning, this, the, the, earning the, the living, if the, if the father's at home taking care of the kids, then it's the father's job. But whoever's there, yeah, it's, it's this project of integration and reintegration. It's, it's trying to reverse, in some sense, the alienations that occurred from the fall. But now, finally, I want to suggest two case studies. Worship and entertainment, all right? Uh, just to think about um, whether a thing worth doing is worth doing badly. And so let me kind of sketch out just sort of briefly here and very sketchily um, two extremes in worship, OK? So let's say that you've got worship as professionalism over here, worship done by the experts, and then worship done by the amateurs, all right? So, you know, those of you who've been to West Winds, um, I've been to West Winds a few times, um, or, or a church like that that relies on a pastoral staff, okay? You're talking about experts in music, in worship, right? You're talking about a pastoral staff, so there's there's staff of youth, uh, there's there's staff of probably uh, you know pastor of children, uh, children's education. There's discipleship pastors. These are all experts. Preaching pastors. There's probably a pastor of latte over there, you know. Um, and then and then if you contrast that with this this tiny church that I I pastor on Sundays, Hope United Methodist. Isn't that a fun name? Uh, Hope United Methodist, um, where there's an average of 30 people, and we're, we're not even talking about amateurs doing the worship. We're talking about liturgists and choir that can be decided on the spot at times. Um, we're talking about hoping that the pianist shows up, but it could be a cappella. And that's, that's a real trip. Okay. Um, but we're, we're talking about people who are not only they're not gifted, you know what I'm saying? They're not even trained. <laughs> okay? Um, unprepared in that sense. So, groups of two or three where you have to just force the choice. Would you rather go um, and worship where you are receiving fairly passively um, a, a worship from professionals, or where all of a sudden um, worship is like, Okay, there's the scripture. Now, um, would you respond to that with the sermon? Okay, that, that would be more. Okay, so I know Mark gets to go groups of two or three. You have to choose one: amateur or professional worship. What would it be? It isn't an either or, really, is it? It shouldn't be, because um, we want this level of aesthetic quality and trained theologians, in one sense. You know, I mean, we, we, want, we, we want people delivering our doctrine 
uh, not you know sort of pulling it out of their back pockets and what I think that this is what God you know is is, is for. He's not actually for. Okay, so um, <laughs> got this new idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else about the professional side? Anything else? So what do we what do we gain from the amateur side? And honesty, okay. So this is this is this is your generation, right? This is we're going to be genuine, we're going to be authentic, uh, and even uh, even if it's not polished, even if if somebody skips a little or fumbles a little bit, there's there's a sense of this is real, okay? What else? Community. Community, yes. Community in the sense that I mean, right? This is the good thing about community, and it's the bad thing about. Community is that now there's a relational messiness involved in this where I really am taking a risk when I get up to say this. And I know that you know me and that you'll remember how poorly I gave that sermon. Possibly, right? Okay. Yeah. What else? A shirt effort. What's that? A, a shirt effort. A shirt effort, okay. They, they, I mean, the professionals, they get into a rhythm. Yes has a tendency to do so. Yes. Whereas those who are amateurs have to put their best foot forward every time. Yes. Yeah, that's great. And so there is, there's an element of the unknown, the kind of risk here that is involved. It's actually like um, like improv. And then like, you know, the, the sort of, uh, whose lane is it anyway, kind of thing. Well, I mean, some real creativity comes out. Of, it's like if, if you're really great at music and you just get together and you start jamming, you know, what could come out of that? Um, yeah, and, and so, so that, that, that creative element is, is really important. Um, participation, right? Now, all of a sudden, there's nobody who's, you know, de facto not involved. Everybody, everybody could be involved. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is a challenge for us, right? To try to, try to bring these together uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's legitimate and authentic and responsible, theologically. Now, the second case study, entertainment. Um, think about this, how much we let the experts entertain us. Now, and, and it's, that's actually antithetical to college life in some ways, right? The whole point of college life is to learn in the dorm to entertain yourself. Mystery date night, right? Um, and, and this is, I mean, it's just wonderful to, uh, um, you know, to, to be shot by a dart gun, J turn or something. Well, you know, is, is a dart gun still? Is that what it is? Okay, yeah. So, uh, you know, these these kinds of things, uh, uh, duct tape wars. I don't know how long it's been since we've had duct tape wars. If you look those up at Messiah, they've got like 400 people coming together in the duct tape wars. But 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 all I remember back in the days of the first duct tape wars when. When Kevin the Bold was uh, fighting, uh, it, but but I mean this was if you know what duct tape wars are, you get you get cardboard and duct tape, and you get to make whatever weapon you can. And uh, I can remember now. I know that this student uh, probably skipped a lot of reading to do this, but there was like a full chainmail, uh, you know, vest made out of duct tape that was like down to here, you know, and and there were helmets and everything like that. I mean, really wonderful, wonderful stuff. Uh, when, when I was at Seattle Pacific University, somehow my junior year got involved in going down to the Union Gospel Mission with a group of students just to hang out at the coffee house. Uh, and it was just to hang out with, with street people. And so we got, it was mostly the same group that went down, probably about 12 to, to 15 students. But that became so much more interesting, so much more real, so much more um, spontaneous and, and exciting that, that you know, you just wouldn't think of like trading that for going to see a movie, right? And so how is it that we could uh, invent uh, our own fun? George MacDonald uh, in his household, they used to write and perform their own plays. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Just sort of think of like high-end family skit night kind of or something like that. Um, but okay, so so okay. Think about think about this in terms of um, of entertainment. Think what it would mean to make a meal together, right? Versus uh, a restaurant, even with friends, because there's something about the time element involved 
in, in dicing carrots, you know, and being in the same room as that's going on, uh, that, that has a, a, a power to it. In his book, Better Off, Eric Brenda, uh, he, he went at his newly, newly married wife, he went off to an Amish community to see if he could live without technology, if they could live without technology for a year. And, uh, and he, so he describes the work that, that you do together in a community like that. So you think of worship, or you think of entertainment and doing things together, that's the key here, the communal, the communal aspect. And he describes it as a social elixir, right? Like you would, you would have these conversations that you would never have. Um, it's like being stuck in a dorm room with someone that you would never choose, right? Um, all of a sudden, things come out, or uh, being in a car for 14 hours driving to Kansas or Colorado or something like that. Here's what he says. He says, the secret lay, much as anything, in simultaneity. Things that technology had separated were reunited. The results were more than efficient. They were symphonic. In an orchestral performance, an oboe, an oboe warbles beside a viola, and the two produce a lush blend. On the porch of a working household, you visit with your mother-in-law while pushing the centers of tomatoes into a bowl, and the breeze brushes against your face, and the leaves rustle, and likewise, music emanates. Isn't that great? So this is, uh, what would it mean to, to do a project together? sort of a, a work project in someone's home or communal gardening, right? These are the kinds of things that, that come out of it. We discover um, each other in ways that we wouldn't discover other ways. Uh, board game night, right? There, there ought to be, uh, is there a board game night? There, there ought to be like spontaneous board game nights in the norm. Uh, what's the one where you, you do, you, it's like a, a picture telephone, you know this one? You do a picture, and then someone has to write what the picture is, and then they pass it on. Right, so, so we did this at Christmas uh, with 13 of us, and we found out at the end, we, we, we had a family pregnancy announced at the end of one. It's like, it was, what? And it's like, the first one was Terrence and Michaela are pregnant, and it ended up tur turning into something like, the, what's her after the chickens asking them out to dance, you know, at the end, or something like that. But, I mean, this is like, this is like such, um, such wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff. Okay, now we've got a few minutes left, so let's let's just try it. Let's just try it. How about it? Okay, so we'll do we'll do a, we'll do an improv. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can have some fun. Uh, we, we need a fairy tale. So someone that we most of, we we most of no what, what fairy tale? Peter Pan. Peter Pan. Uh, uh, to give me some other idea, Peter Pan. Three little pigs. Okay, three little pigs. Let's do three little pigs. Okay, uh, I need three pigs. Okay, come on up here. Three pigs. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, three pigs. Three pigs. And we need a wolf, right? Okay, there's your wolf. Okay. Three pigs and a wolf. Okay, we're going to do the 60 second fairy tale. Okay, so we're going to give them a minute to plan, okay? And then we're going to do, I'll narrate if I need to. And then we'll do, uh, we'll do the, the, uh, the 60 second version, okay? So. Yeah, I'm not going to. 